Hi guys, can you hear me okay? Sorry, that's really loud, huh? There we go, you can really hear me. Um, it's nice to meet everyone, I'm Dr. Jessica Berry, and this is uh, Dr. Jessica Philpott, um, who will also introduce herself after. So I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist at Cleveland Clinic Children's, um, and Dr. Philpott is uh, an adult gastroenterologist at Cleveland Clinic. So um, we're gonna go through, we're gonna kind of split things up a little bit. Um, I'm gonna be talking a lot about just from uh, women's and children's and girls' health, and then uh, Dr. Philpott will carry on uh, for the remaining of the portion talking about some other topics in women's health. So we'll hope to, at the end, be able to have some time for you to ask questions as well. Um, so we will walk around at the end to make sure everybody has an opportunity for that, okay? Okay. Um, so just some disclosures quickly. Um, so some things we're gonna talk about today. So first I'm gonna start out talking about uh, birth to puberty, uh, talking about some transitional care. We're gonna be focusing on sexual health, body image, and uh, fertility, pregnancy, and then preventive care and overall women's topics and health uh, maintenance and inflammatory bowel disease. Um, so obviously it's a very important, oops, sorry, very important topic. There are more than 800,000 women um, in the United States have inflammatory bowel disease, and the majority of those women and women are actually affected during their childbearing years. So talking about birth to puberty overall, so 25% of patients with IBD are actually diagnosed by 20 years of age. So having these conversations early and making sure that we're uh, discussing topics in women's health very early on and starting right away is so, is so important. Um, aspects that we look at and why is it important and things that affect children a little bit different, differently than women and adults is growth fa failure, pubertal delays um, can occur in both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And there's a stronger association with growth derangements and Crohn's disease overall, even above ulcerative colitis. Things that play a role and are so important and why does this matter and why is it important to intervene in childhood? Sorry, this is going forward without me participating. So uh, uh, it's nutritional status, degree of inflammation, stress, all of these can affect growth hormone and risks and increased risk for delays. In menstrual irregularities and why it's so important even discussing early on with young women as we're approaching our menstrual and pubertal periods is can affect our menstrual status. So anywhere from irregularities being amenorrhea, dysmenorrhea, or uncomfortable, heavy, or abnormal period cycles are very common and oftentimes increase in young women and women with inflammatory bowel disease. We've looked at different studies looking at um, importance of uh, optimal disease and inflammatory control and how that affects menstrual management and cycles. And also additionally, how do menstrual cycles sometimes mimic or influence some of IBD symptoms? Additionally, seeing that sometimes ongoing inflammation or active inflammation may additionally affect that. So it's really important and why we're so focused on optimal disease control early and achieving remission because these are necessary entities to ensure appropriate growth and development. Transitional care, which I'm sure you're hearing and talking about in some of the other topics and um, groups today, is so important because as we're transitioning through prepubertal, pubertal, young women, young girls, in developing on until becoming women and transitioning to their adult gastroenterologist, it's important that these aspects of care are seamless and that we're addressing all points to ensure that there are no gaps in care and that families and patients feel comfortable in having discussions about their care needs throughout their entire lifetime, starting at diagnosis entirely through. Transfer, what does that mean? So transfer a patient from child-centered to adult-centered care. And then transition, what is, is saying when we're talking about the primary responsibility of IBD management from family to more uh, and to more of the patient uh, and a patient-focused process, which is a gradual process, not something that happens overnight. Um, that transition timeline, unfortunately, often occurs during high-stress times of life, right? We're going to college, we're thinking about having children, we're in our reproductive prime and time periods, we're having changes in body image, pubertal status, right, sexual health. There's a lot of things that are happening, or socioeconomic changes, right, as I like to call it adulting, when we're changing that period, and now it's, now it's our responsibility as we, as we transition, transition forward. Oftentimes, sometimes even pregnancy. Pregnancy may be the triggering or indicating factor for transition to an adult provider if happening sooner than maybe we expected and we're looking to our adult colleagues additionally for feedback and experience with um, pregnancy care in the setting of inflammatory bowel disease, which is not something as a pediatric gastroenterologist that we often are as well voiced in or are seeing on a regular basis. 
the important thing to note, there's no perfect one size fits all for time of transfer. We had these conversations early and that's why it's so important because we wanna make sure that our patients are ready and are knowledgeable of what does transition mean and that we find them and get them settled with adult gastroenterology and their future providers so that they can continue a good experience that hopefully they've already had with us as pediatric gastroenterologists. Um, and you know, it's important to make sure it's a time that's right for the patient, the family, and, and not feeling like there is a set time and then I, I don't see you again. That's a, a common question I get from my patients. I'm going to college, does that mean like I'll never see you again and, and, and I need to figure out what's next? That's, and that's not the case and it should not be the case, okay? So moving on, talking about sexual and reproductive health, we're gonna talk about body image and sexuality. So um, certainly such an important aspect of quality of life and diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease can affect that and play a role. So be it active gastrointestinal symptoms, past surgeries or surgical, um, surgical care that maybe affects how we feel about our body image, medications, so why we're all honed and very prone to making sure we're talking about steroid sparing um, medication and therapies when possible because effects of steroids on our body image and, and, and physical appearance uh, can be stressful. And the adolescent development of body image, you know, starts early and we wanna make sure we're sporting that from a psychological and physical aspect and making sure patients understand what are those potentially negative or uncomfortable changes that may be occurring. And we want, we wanna make sure that you feel open and comfortable to talk to your gastroenterologist about what your concerns are, what you're feeling, because we may be able to help you or guide you through uh, um, some of those changes and give you the support that you need. So certainly, as I, as I like to say, and I've, uh, I've shared this from other, uh, other slides, everybody is beautiful. We're not looking at trying to define what, what is beauty, right? What is, what is each individual person or how we should fit? Um, and supporting our patients and knowing them that physical well-being. So I love these photos from um, Bear Those Bags talking about just being role modeling to you know, our individual self as well as um, our future children who are gonna see this and, and, and giving the support that patients need to know that you know, you're not alone and there are, are options out there to support. Um, talking about now moving forward a little bit, menstrual cycles and health. I know I mentioned a little bit about how inflammatory bowel disease can affect our menses, our menstrual cycles, and how that makes us feel, as we all know, um, as women. Um, hormonal fluctuations, and especially even during gastrointestinal symptoms, if they're active in inflammatory bowel disease, may complicate how we're feeling through our menstrual cycles. Um, our menstrual cycles may pose a, a risk or making us be confusing as, is that a gastrointestinal symptom or is that a menstrual symptom? And that's something that I commonly have conversations uh, with my young female uh, patients once they're starting their menses. Additionally, making sure that their menstrual cycles are regular and they're coming on time, I say is a part of a normal vital sign and a healthy aspect of how you're doing and tells me your nutritional status, inflammatory status. Sorry guys, this keeps going forward. Um, and making sure if there are symptoms with menses that are causing discomfort or maybe being confusing to some of those symptoms to help uh, look at medical management if possible to help alleviate symptoms when possible. Um, importance of thinking about also in the ideas and medications that we utilize that ibuprofen products aren't a great choice. We're looking at things that are not gonna lead to more mucosal and irritation. And just letting you know and making sure, like talk to your providers, talk to your gastroenterologist. There are options out there to be able to help regulate cycles or if that is becoming a very disruptive case, be it regardless of your inflammatory bowel disease, okay? Um, and along with sexual health, um, so in not just specifically in women with inflammatory bowel disease, right? We can have um, increased uh, sexual dysfunction, which is present in women in general, up to 50% of the general population, but there is a slight increase um, in the setting of patients with inflammatory bowel disease. Surgical history, or as we talk about body images, um, and that physical appearance and how we feel, that certainly can sometimes affect um, how our sexual health is affected in the end, okay? And anything we can do to help improve disease control may improve those outcomes. And along those lines with menstrual management or, or cycle management, if those are also additionally causing problems. So again, 
talk with your, your gastroenterology provider. It's a team with your gynecologist. We work together. I do this very frequently, even starting um, in prepubertal or pubertal young women, uh, having early conversations about finding a good pediatric gastroenterologist uh, or your pediatric gynecologist. And then additionally, um, if you need adolescent medicine, if we're having issues with cycle management. Um, and then subsequently, contraception, be it for menstrual cycle management or reproductive health, not just alone for one or the other, are important things to consider as we look at options. Um, as a rule, we like to avoid estrogen-containing medications just because of increased risk of blood clots, and certainly that can be increased depending on what medication management is used um, for therapy for your IBD. Depo or medroxyprogesterone is another injectable contraceptive that we talk about um, that I, sorry, this is going forward. I'm not touching it. There it goes. I'm going to try to get it here. Um, where it can be avoided if you have risk of high fractures or low bone density or which is already a risk in the setting of inflammatory bowel disease is not always a great option. Um, and I talk with my patients about what the, their desires are, what are they looking for in contraceptive management, and what are their goals and outcomes that, they're, that they would like to achieve, and then thus choosing what would be a good option, then putting you in contact with your gynecologist or adolescent uh, medicine provider. So first-line options, which are always good options, uh, such as levonorgestrel or, as we talk about, intrauterine or IUD devices, um, be it copper or medication-based, um, are good options for non-estrogen therapies. Uh, Second-line injectable contraceptives or progestin-only pills. And then third-line, if needed, a combination estrogen-based contraceptive pills or transdermal patches, vaginal rings. But again, many of these tend to have uh, estrogen-containing components, and we try to avoid those um, as much as possible. Um, so certainly, again, just making sure you're having those open conversations and recognizing your gastroenterologist is a part of that team, um, not just your gynecologist, okay? Um, so then moving into, you know, next step uh, of life when we're talking about for menstrual management, reproductive health, uh, menopause, which occurs in all women, um, it's important to recognize this may be a, as a natural progression. It could be a surgical onset of menopause, um, essentially being when your ovaries or a reproductive system stops producing estrogen, your periods stop, your menstrual cycles stop, and for at least 12 months or more without another cause, unless, as I said, being surgically uh, related, which is... Um, you know, not a gradual process necessarily. So we don't really know at this point how inflammatory bowel disease interacts um, with menopause. We believe there may be some close hormonal interaction or possible hormonal interactions with inflammatory bowel disease and menopause and disease activity. Um, so it's important to make sure you're talking with your team of providers, your gynecologists, your gastroenterologists about what's happening, when are there changes in your menstrual cycles, and especially if you're thinking about therapies or hormonal therapies um, for menopause, which sometimes may be estrogen-based or higher estrogen-based um, in the setting of your IBD. Um, and just that's why, uh, you know, myself as a provider, and I know Dr. Philpot and many other providers, your conversation about what your menstrual cycles are during your visits, discussing your, your, you know, how you're doing for your IBD visits and updates, I always ask, are menstrual cycles regular, you know, opening that conversation so it's an opportunity and time to check in and make sure everything's going okay or if there's any concerns that arise. So now I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Phil Pott, and she's going to then I'll, I'll come back and then we'll let you guys ask some questions, okay? Well, thank you, Jessica. That's been very interesting, and I always learn a lot. Okay, so let's talk about fertility, pregnancy, and beyond. So um, the good news is that the um, first of all, fertility rates in non-operated patients with IBD with well-controlled disease are similar to the general population. So there's not a big impact from having IBD. Um, the presence of active disease has been associated in, in particular for patients with Crohn's with decreased fertility. There's no evidence that IBD medications impact negatively your fertility. So, you know, sometimes people are asking me, oh my gosh, is this going to reduce my risk of conceiving? And um, no, that's not the case. In general, the impact of fertility, um, of surgery on fertility is not clear. So, you know, we'd really like to know that, and we'd like to know are there certain surgical techniques our surgeons can help us with that can reduce the impact. Um, but in general, if it does have an impact, it's fairly low. 
Um, the main exception is the um, J pouch or the colectomy where they make a J pouch. And that may reduce the uh, um, fertility to some extent, but the good news is patients that undergo that have the same rate of successful conception with assisted reproduction that uh, other patients do. So there's options, but that is something to keep in mind when you're looking at your surgical choices. Um, assisted reproduction, so that would be uh, in vitro fertilization and things of that nature, is safe and effective in women with IBD. So again, the good news is the rates of um, success in patients with IBD is the same as patients do not have IBD that go on to need assisted reproduction. I think the most important thing is discuss planning, uh, family planning early and often with your IBD provider. And this is not just the case for women, it's also true for men. So any of my patients I really like to know, I know I'm kind of, they feel like I'm prying sometimes, but I wanna know what are your goals, you know? And sometimes when they first come to meet me and the whole family's in the room, I might not ask them, but um, it is an important part of my visit with them to understand because this, if it's something that someone wants, it's an important part of their quality of life. So it's something I need to know. Um, disease status really does impact the um, success of conception and health of pregnancy. So again, we're always trying to get you people healthy. We always wanna achieve remission, but it's particularly important in this situation. If pregnancy is something you want and it's not happening, um, seek help early, okay? There's a lot of different ways in 2022 that we can help people achieve parenthood, and, but sometimes we need to start early. So if this is something you want, it's something you wanna to talk to them about. I look at the phases of conception care in three phases. And the most really, I think what's most important is preconception care. So we really wanna plan in advance. If this is something that's important to someone, knowing this in advance, doing any tests I need prior to that pregnancy, making sure all the vitamins are replaced and their disease is in control is really important before they actually go to conceive. Um, and then the next phase is during pregnancy. So while my patient's pregnant, there's a lot of things I need to attend to. And then finally, post-conception is important too, because after my, the baby's born, that's a whole new ballpark there, and we wanna keep mom healthy, dad healthy, if it, the, um, and the baby healthy. Um, in general, it's the pregnancy outcomes for women with IBD is very positive. So in general, women do well, the babies do well, there's a small increased risk of adverse outcomes compared to other women. So there's a little bit, we're gonna watch you as a high risk pregnancy. You know, we wanna be careful with you, but the good news is people do well and the babies do well. There's a slightly increased risk of preterm delivery and low birth weight. Um, women that have IBD and um, deliver, there's a much higher rate of cesarean section than for other women. And some people, we see a slightly higher rate of gestational diabetes and placental disease. But in general, close monitoring by your gastroenterologist and your uh, obstetrician during the pregnancy um, usually will involve a um, maternal fetal medicine specialist. Nutrition, psychology, and surgery really maximize the odds for a healthy pregnancy. Um, in, re in relationship to that though, it's very important that we control the disease during the pregnancy. So we do know that active disease can negatively impact the um, outcome of the pregnancy. And so um, if patients have active UC, that's associated with a uh, low birth weight of the babies. Um, if someone has really active disease, there may be a four to five fold increased risk of pregnancy loss. There's a slightly increased risk of congenital anomalies and lower birth weight. So again, it's kind of our job. We wanna work together and make sure that the disease is controlled and that's the best way we can help it be a pre healthy pregnancy. It's really important um, how the disease is doing prior to pregnancy will impact um, how the disease is during the pregnancy. So I really try and get people in remission before we move on to conception. And if you look at this graph, so if a patient's um, ulcerative colitis is active before the pregnancy, it's highly likely it's gonna be active during the pregnancy. If they're in remission, it's pretty rare that they're gonna go into um, active <coughs> disease during pregnancy. And ulcerative colitis patients, we see a little bit more risk of flares than in Crohn's. Um, during the pregnancy, but if we can go into the pregnancy and remission, that gives us a good chance of staying during the pregnancy. So before, again, I like to have a preconception plan. So again, I'm seeing people in the office, I'm prying, you know, do you think you wanna get pregnant? Um, when do you wanna get pregnant? Um, and I think it's important to have the discussion before conception. Are you on medicines that you and I are comfortable you being on during the pregnancy? And sometimes what I'm comfortable with you being on you may not be comfortable being on, and it's important that you tell me that. 
facts, like straight up, because it's a, you know, this is a collaboration and there's some things, and maybe you're not comfortable with something and I can explain to you what I know about that, but what we don't want to happen is someone to get pregnant and be like, oh my gosh, I'm pregnant and I don't like this, you know, I really am not comfortable with this mess and not sure I need it and just stopping it without having that conversation because again, that gets back to when um, the most important part of the um, health in the pregnancy is controlling the disease. Um, I like people to be on stable medications for three to six months before conception. Um, I wanna look into their vitamins, make sure everyone needs to be on prenatal vitamins, make sure B12 and folate are replaced. So in regards to medication use during pregnancy, and I get asked this a lot, right? And it really, you know, I can say when, you know, I'm, I've been pregnant, I know how it is, like everything I was exposed to, I'm like, oh my gosh, what's going on with this? Is this the right thing for me? And so I completely understand that when someone's pregnant and they're on, let's say two medicines for their Crohn's, they're like, do I really, is this really the right thing to be on during pregnancy? So I think just to assure you that most of the medicines, and we have lots of data on them, are safe and we're gonna talk about this, but I understand it's a question that people have and it's you know in the back of your mind, like am I doing the right thing? There are some medicines that we certainly suggest use with caution. And again, there's um, no no's 100% except for methotrexate, absolutely do not wanna be on that during pregnancy, should be off for three months prior. We have a lot of newer medicines that are just coming out in the past couple of years. We don't have enough data and there's some concerns. So tofacidinib, ozama, and upacidinib really should not be on those um, when trying to conceive at this juncture unless there's something special going on with that. And then cyclosporin, castor oil, I don't think anyone uses much of, hopefully. <laughs> no one's on castor oil here. Um, that's <laughs> some scary stuff. But, but anyway, don't, if you're pregnant, don't be taking that. And then some of the antidiarrheals we in general try to avoid in the first trimester. The good news is most IBD medicines are perfectly safe in pregnancy. Um, a number of them we have 20 years of preg experience now, right? So, you know, infliximab came out more than 20 years ago. And so there's been a lot of babies born on these drugs. And so we know that they're safe. And again, we want to keep the pregnancy healthy. So biologics, immune modulators if needed, mesalamine, all considered safe. Steroids in general, if someone has to be on them, you know, we do it if it's necessary, but we try and limit those because they're not the safest thing for pregnancy, honestly. Like, a biologic actually has better data than steroids during pregnancy. Again, like we talked about before, talk to, talk to your physician. If there's something you're worried about, don't keep it quiet. We wanna know what you're concerned about, okay? Um, because we wanna together be comfortable with the medicines that you're on during pregnancy. When someone is pregnant, I'm gonna to wanna to watch them more closely because again, healthy mom, healthy baby. Kinda of talked about the medicines already. Some of your labs are gonna look different during pregnancy than they do when you're not pregnant. So sometimes people, it's very common for women to become anemic during pregnancy even if they're not pregnant. So that happens, we, the OBs are great with it, we know how to deal with it. Sometimes your inflammatory markers go up. So in certain phases of pregnancy, the CRP, which some people's physicians follow pretty closely, including myself, it's gonna go up just from the pregnancy. So if something's off and you're like, oh my gosh, you know, you get those labs sent to you on the computer, they can be abnormal, just talk to your physician. It's a little bit hard to monitor your disease during pregnancy because I can't do a lot of the tests that I do when you're not pregnant, right? So we try and, CAT scans almost never do because that's ionizing radiation. We can do MRIs, but we avoid one of the dyes, gadolinium. Um, procedures are done if you really need it, so if that's gonna help me figure out what's going on, but we don't do a lot of them during pregnancy. But there's some surrogate tests or non-invasive tests like calprotectin, that stool test that we can do. And so basically we wanna keep an eye on you, make sure you're doing all right. One of the important aspects of uh, pregnancy that can really impact the health is weight gain. And in fact, inadequate weight gain is associated with adverse pregnancy outcomes. And women with IBD have slightly a lower, you know, more likely to have trouble gaining weight. So what I always tell my patients is, if your OB is not happy with how you're gaining weight, don't wait to your next visit with me. You need to, you know, call me or call, call my friends in the, in the back of the room or here listening, but call the nurses, call me, send me a my chart. I need to know if you're not gaining weight. Don't, because we're gonna look into it now. We're gonna make sure is that from the 
disease being active or maybe you're not feeling well and we need to get you a nutritionist to get some more nutrition in you. But this is important. If someone's not gaining weight during pregnancy, I want to know why. In terms of delivery during pregnancy, um, for a lot of women, vaginal delivery is still possible. Remember I told you earlier on that we do have a higher rate of C-section. There are some people that we really consider C-section um, if they have active perianal disease from Crohn's, so a lot of fistulas, it's probably better if they have a C-section. Um, if they've had a colectomy with that pouch, the IPAA, sometimes we'll recommend a C-section. But again, talk to your provider, because everyone has a different delivery plan or a different feeling about that. And um, having a delivery plan is important. If you have had surgery before, so let's say you've had a couple of Crohn's surgeries, it's really important that your OB consult with a surgeon prior to your delivery, because if you have to have a C-section, it's good to have a surgeon available. In terms of breastfeeding, um, it's encouraged, so if it's what you want to do. So again, not everyone wants to breastfeed. Sometimes they can't breastfeed, but if it's something important to you, People with IBD certainly can breastfeed, and it may be protective for early development of IBD. Most of the medicines that we give you are compatible uh, with breastfeeding. Again, those newer ones I told you that we don't know about for pregnancy, we really don't know about for breastfeeding yet, so I'd avoid breastfeeding on those methotrexate again. I get asked a lot about biologics um, because there's some studies that show that there are trace amounts of biologics in breast milk, but if you think about it, if you could take, uh, you know, infliximab or any of these biologics by mouth, you wouldn't be giving yourself shots or coming to get infusions. So the babies really don't get enough in them to cause trouble. Um, what time are we at? I think we were going to talk about preventative care, but I think in general these are probably have been covered in some of the other talks. As you know, vaccines are important. Bone health is important. Um, mental health screen is very important nutrition. So I think at this point, um, you know, get your mammogram, get your pap smear. Um, anxiety and depression is common when your disease is in remission, and when it's not, it's common for all of us. So, it, and it's an important part of quality care for IBD. So if things are going on that aren't being addressed, really make sure that we get a provider to help out with that. So um, I think at this point, we'd like to get some time for questions. So. Um, so let's start off. Any questions? Or did we talk too fast? We, we like bowled you over with that. Okay. Well, thanks for meeting with us. <laughs>